Hello, everybody. Welcome. We're going to give it just a minute to um, to get some people in here. Dr. Bloomgarden. Welcome. We see so many familiar faces. You may from time to time hear my son in the background who is practicing for a theater performance. So if you hear any background noise, just know that that is what is happening. <laughs> Dr. Bloomgarden, I'm going to send you another, oh, perfect, just happened. And just know spaces could get a little wonky tonight, largely because we should have a pretty good audience. And so that is normal. So let's be patient in case that happens. Okay, let's see. Dr. Jane, you're good. I'm going to make you a co-host as well. Thank you, everybody, as you're coming in. I want to keep saying welcome, welcome to this incredible space at National Women Physicians Day 2022. And we will get this formally started very soon with my two amazing powerhouse women co-hosts. Nice to see familiar faces here. Good evening. Nice to see you all. Um, and as we're waiting for people to come in, um, Dr. Bloomgarden, Dr. Jane, how were your days? There's been a lot of activity today for National Women Physicians Day and all the work you're doing with your nonprofits. We're just going to chit chat while we uh, welcome people into the space. How are both of you tonight? So I'm doing great. I will say to everybody listening, this is my first ever Twitter space that I've actually spoken in. So bear with me if I don't know what the heck I'm doing, but I'm here. <laughs> and um, my day was insane because it was National Women Physicians Day. And that meant that we had so many different women we wanted to support and honor and amplify. And I feel like I spent the entire day just either talking to amazing women or amplifying amazing women. So it was exhausting, but a good kind of exhaustion. I love that. Dr. Bloomgarden, what about you? I would say I just I was enjoying the all the shout outs on Twitter and the and the celebration. I think the uh the funniest part is when my husband got home from work, I said, Well, do you know what today is? And he had no idea. And he's a physician too. So I was like, Well, I guess we still have work to do. Um, <laughs> but... <laughs> oh, mine too. Of... Mine too. Like, my wow. husband both of you. <laughs> <laughs> my husband's also a physician. I was like, um, do you want to wish me something? And he's like, It's not our anniversary, it's not your birthday. And there I was, was like, definitely no. panic. Yeah, panic. <laughs> he's like, uh oh, oh my god, what did I do? And I was like, No, it's National Women's Physicians Day. Didn't you get an email from your hospital? And he was like, I don't know if I did. So, <laughs> you know, I was like, well, I guess we'll have to start at home next time. But <laughs> indeed, you could have worked it for a minute and gotten some flowers with kind of I a should have, but I was, you know, I was in posturing. But okay. <laughs> I was posturing about doing this. So I was, I was too nervous to, to get to manipulate the situation. <laughs> okay, that's fair. That's fair. And as people come in, we want to welcome you. We want to thank you for joining us tonight. We know that we all have very busy lives and we are all still very much dealing with the impacts of COVID. It's been a very long two years. So I think most of us are joking about this is the 197th day of January. Um, <laughs> it's the I think it's 3, February. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> did, I, did I already make my point? So we, we, it's, been, it's been long. And so for those of you that are joining us, my point here to you this evening is that we know that there are a lot of uh, choices you could make about where you're spending your time. And the fact that you are gracing us with your time this evening means a great deal. And we are here for those of you in our audience this evening who are women in medicine. We are here to honor you, talk about your story and your experiences as women in medicine, and give you some information about some of the great work that these two powerhouse women physicians are doing, not only as practicing physicians, but in the nonprofit space, doing all kinds of really important things. And as many of you know, you know, medicine is kind of at the forefront of this whole planet right now. Um, so no better time than now for us to talk about that. So with that in mind, um, I will formally kick this off by saying, number one, welcome to Women in Medicine, National Women Physician Day, February 3rd, 2022. I was honored to be asked by Dr. Bloomgarden. Bloomgarden? All right, we're going to go with that. And Dr. Jane to host and moderate this conversation this evening along with women in medicine. And just a moment before I kick this off to Dr. Jane to give you some background, the United States Census, of course, we just completed that, <clears throat> and some information from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the Occupational Outlook Handbook, what physicians and surgeons do. Physicians and surgeons diagnose and treat injuries or illnesses and address health maintenance. Physicians examine patients, take medical histories, 
prescribe medications, and order, perform, and interpret diagnostic tests. They often counsel patients on diet, hygiene, and preventative health care. Surgeons operate on patients to treat injuries such as broken bones, diseases such as cancerous tumors, and deformities such as cleft palates. There are two types of physicians with similar degrees, a medical doctor and a DO, a doctor of osteopathic medicine. Both use the same methods of treatment, including drugs and surgery, but DOs place additional emphasis on the body's musculoskeletal system, preventative medicine, and holistic whole person patient care. DOs are more likely to be primary care physicians, although they do work in specialties. And with that, Dr. Jane, I would love to kick this over to you. And again, welcome everybody to this space on women in medicine. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. And Stephanie, because of the forum we're in and because I think of you as a friend and I think of Eve as a friend, um, feel free to call me Shika by my first name throughout this conversation today, because I think that uh, that'll make it easier for us to just have a conversation about this really important work that we're doing. Uh, so yes, today is National Women Physicians Day, which, you know, it's really funny. Eve and I were joking just now at the beginning of this that our husbands who are both physicians didn't know about today. And that might be because it hasn't been around for that long. Uh, it was actually started by Dr. Hala Sabri, who also started the Physician Mom Group. And she basically had this huge effort to create this national day to recognize women physicians. And it was created in honor of Elizabeth Blackwell, Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell, who was the first woman to be accepted into a medical school at the United, in the United States. And the funny thing, and I actually didn't know this, when she was admitted, the all-male student body took a vote, and they thought it was a joke. And so they voted to admit her, but then turns out the joke was on them because she ended up graduating first in her class. So she is who this day was really named in honor of because she was such a pioneer at the beginning of uh, women entering into uh, the physician workforce. Without, um, without her, we would not be where we are today. And I also want to take a moment to mention some other amazing women in medicine who are pioneers. There was Dr. Rebecca Lee Crumpler, who was the first African-American woman to earn an MD in the U.S. Uh, there was Dr. Susan LaFleche Picot, who was the first Native American woman doctor in the U.S. That was 35 years before Native Americans were even recognized as U.S. citizens. So that was really a feat. And then Dr. Mary Edwards Walter, who was actually an American feminist, a suffragist. She was suspected to be a spy and a prisoner of war and surgeon. And she was the only woman who ever received the Medal of Honor. So there's a lot of amazing women in the history of medicine. And unfortunately, we don't hear a lot about them. So my hope is that by, my kid, by the time my kids are old enough to be physicians or whatever they decide to be in their careers, this will become a day that we celebrate just as well as we celebrate all the other national holidays. Um, so I get asked a lot, why, why do we do this? I started a nonprofit called Women in Medicine. I do a conference called the Women in Medicine Summit. And I get asked all the time, why do you spend the limited amount of free time that you have pushing these efforts toward working on gender equity in healthcare? And I want to give you a couple of stats to start. So ever since 2019, over 50% of medical school student enrollees have been women. Women make up over 70% of the healthcare workforce. But of that 70%, there's only about 40% of women who are in the executive role. And when you look at physicians, that's even lower. And when you talk about academic medicine, for example, so things like deans and department chairs, despite the fact that we've had many, many women entering into the medical, um, into medical school and getting into the medical workforce, we have a very leaky pipeline where women start as medical students, but by the time they become full-fledged physicians, many of them have left or they have been pushed out. Um, we only see about 18% of our deans are actually women. Uh, we see about 25% of full pre professors are women. So what this means is we're not, we're not providing the women who are entering into medical school ambitious, excited, ready to work and take care of patients and take on leadership to fix the healthcare system. We're not seeing them advance into positions of leadership. And then that's directly impacting patient care. So the saddest thing to me is some of the most amazing women that I know have left medicine altogether. And the reason they've left medicine is because they feel like there is just no way for them to either advance their career or there's no way for them to overcome the barriers that are in their place to take excellent care of their patients. And 
there's so much data out there that shows that when you have women in leadership roles, it actually translates into women um, patients doing better and actually male patients doing better. There was a study that came out recently showing that women surgeons, when women surgeons operated on women patients, they had less complications. Um, there was a study showing that women actually had less readmission rates to the hospital. So women can provide exceptional care to patients and they do, but oftentimes that patient care is going to suffer because we're not seeing the women advance into leadership. And to be honest, we're not seeing women stay in medicine. So that is just a little summary of what I think is really important when it comes to gender equity in healthcare. It impacts patient care. It impacts organizations. It impacts healthcare systems. It impacts the way we deliver healthcare. And at the end of the day, it really does impact our healthcare workforce. And we see very many brilliant women uh, leaving medicine. And it's just sad and unfortunate that this is this is what ends up happening. So that's why I spend so much of my time working on this, because I've had great mentors and sponsors in my life. And I want to make sure that all of the women out there who are interested in pursuing whatever type of career they want, have that ability to achieve what they want in their professional and personal lives. And I'll hand the baton over to my amazing co-host, Dr. Eve Bloomgarden. And Shika, if you don't mind, and Dr. Bloomgarden, I apologize. I just wanted to welcome the newer people that we have coming into our space this evening. Again, welcome to Women in Medicine. We are here to celebrate National Women Physician Day. And I wanted to mention that our two doctors here that are joining me on the stage have about an hour. Um, and so with that in mind, what I wanted to let all of you in the audience know is that we're going to go ahead and set the table. I'll hand this over to Eve so she can actually offer up her portion of how she wanted to sort of set the table for this evening. If you would like to request to speak, you are more than welcome to do so. If I can clearly see your profile picture, and I have an idea that you're a human, that's amazing. <laughs> if you do have a profile picture that's an emoji or a cat or something, I would really prefer for the sake of keeping um, this space integrous, if you could send me a direct message as they are open on my uh, profile. You are welcome to do so. Just let me know who you are and what you'd like to mention. Um, the purpose of tonight is to add value. It's to add value to all of you as to why all of us should care about women physicians and women in medicine in general and offer you some background and history of this. And then for certainly men in the room, we are not, this is not devolving into an anti-man physician comment. It's not what's happening at all. Um, we are all in this together, but understanding that women do have um, some specific issues and challenges that they are facing as healthcare practitioners, and that we are also looking for men in medicine and men outside of medicine to create an allyship to help amplify and assist women in this practice, as women do bring special things to the table. So with that, I appreciate you allowing that. Dr. Bloomgarden, go ahead. Know that I think that was a perfect segue. And again, um, for the sake of the space here, um, and to keep the conversation casual, please um, call me Eve. And I do, um, I do hope that some people have have um, the desire to speak or to come up and, and share their story here. Because uh, what I wanted to do next was really just talk about kind of the why, why this matters, why we're why we're here, why we're so passionate about this. Um, and, you know, why we're spending a lot of time on this organization, in addition to what we're doing um, at our full time jobs, taking care of patients and also um, as, 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 you know, ha as spouses, as having families, as uh, having kids, you know, we, we do a lot of this work in our free time. But the reason that I do it is, is because when I um, finished my training, you know, after years and years of that, I really found myself um, in a situation where I really, I was encountering barriers that I didn't really know were there and I didn't really know how to navigate them. Um, and it, it was something that I had not encountered before. And a lot of it was, was to do with kind of the cultural infrastructure of medicine and just how things, you know, how, how the game is played that I, I didn't know about. I was in a new place and every, every kind of time I tried to go up and do something new or do something different, I, I was, I was kind of halted in my tracks and as I started to appreciate that maybe, you know, stopped internalizing what was going on and started asking more questions and started talking to colleagues and friends about it, it turns out a lot of women in medicine have very similar experiences. And by that, I mean, there are things that we keep kind of quiet, but that are, um, that really we were all experiencing in a way that made it too, too much, it couldn't be coincidence. And as I started to appreciate that and started to realize, oh, it's not me, there are some structural barriers here that really need to be addressed. It was really empowering. Um, and it allowed me to kind of take a deeper dive. In, and it really allowed me to continue going in my career. And, you know, it didn't stop. This was years and years ago. And I would have given up then. And what I what my big fear is that there are women now who are just starting 
in their careers who may be encountering obstacles and don't have the um, don't have the the fortune of really appreciating that it's not them. And so that's kind of what we are here. We want to reach everyone and to realize there are some structural issues in um, in the practice of medicine that we can really that we're working to change so that we're not losing so many talented and brilliant women um, and we're not seeing uh, this attrition from the work from the workforce. Um, and I think, again, to echo what Shika had said, we are right now at the end of two years of this global pandemic, we are seeing just this exodus that what, we're, what was being called the great resignation is really is really happening across all industries, but especially across healthcare. And we're seeing it in all, all parts of healthcare. But we do see that it's a disproportionately um, affecting women. And it's not that women are choosing to quit, but, you know, it, or choosing to give up on kind of patient care, but it's really, there are so many things that we've struggled with over the last two years between caregiving and life stress and illness and, um, and working with the sickest patients and also dealing with patients who, you know, are victims of misinformation and not, you know, not willing to, or not, you know, not taking the vaccine because of something they heard. And, you know, there's a lot that, that kind of plays into that and it's very trying on everyone. So with all of those factors, what we see is that women are leaving disproportionately and the effect on the healthcare system that was already running quite lean and was our, we were already facing a workforce shortage, you know, before the pandemic that's been magnified and that has been um, really brought to the forefront. And we're seeing just a state where healthcare as we know it is really on the verge of, of changing and not for the better. So we really want to focus on retention. We want to focus on recruiting allies and making sure that we have a strong plan moving forward. And that's part of what we do in women in medicine is we've, um, we've built out a solutions based approach to try and address some of these issues. So that's kind of my intro. I know that was like a lot of information here, but um, I'm interested to see, I see a couple of speakers here. So I'm, I'm kind of interested to see what um, others have to say, and then we can kind of pivot back to, to dive into some of these solutions um, a little bit further. Eve, thank you. We're absolutely going to do that. And again, I want to welcome those of you who are new this evening to join um, this conversation. We are, let me add you as a speaker. Sorry, we have, um, it's going to get a little wonky, so just be patient. I just wanted to invite our first speaker request to the conversation, your um, your profile is the professional nursing. Welcome to the conversation, and you're welcome to unmute and join us. If you can, can you hear me? Your profile says staff nurse in an emergency department. And if we lost you for a minute, maybe you got a phone call because that certainly does happen. I would like to move to Annalise. Um, Sorrentino, I hope, and I want to just give her props because above your profile picture is the Ted Lasso Believe. Welcome to the conversation. Anna, can you hear us? <laughs> I can. Can you hear me? I can, and I love it. Wonderful. Ted Lasso. I love it. <laughs> well, I mean, what's not to love, right? What's not to um, love? Just an amazing, amazing group. You know, I, I, I work in a pediatric emergency department. I worked a shift today. I looked around, and I'm so amazed at all the, you know, incredible women that I work with who have trained me, who, you know, in pediatrics is a little bit more female heavy than maybe some of the other subspecialties. And so I, I, I feel myself very fortunate um, to be in that position and hopefully pay it forward a little bit to some of the, the up and coming female uh, physicians since I have been doing this for a few years now. It seems like it was just yesterday, but looking back, it's been a lot longer. Um, I think one of my, you know, I, and I've been in academics my entire career. Um, and I think one question that I had for some of you guys is how do you, some of the um, experiences and the biggest challenges that I have run up against haven't even necessarily been against uh, male colleagues, but female colleagues. Um, and so just, uh, you know, is there, to me, you know, it, it, it seems like we should all be in this together. I don't understand uh, where this is coming from, but have you had any experience in dealing with a, a challenging female uh, colleague, and, and how have you dealt with that? 
Shika, do you want to take this one? Yeah, that's such a good and hard question because you're right. It feels like it should be we're all in this together. And so when you have a female colleague who may not necessarily have your back or may not feel like she's supporting you, it, it can be difficult or, or she's possibly even going against you or, 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 you know, sabotaging you in some situations. I think, you know, the thing that I've learned through my career is you don't know where other people are coming from. And this is not an excuse for women who behave like this because I don't think that it's okay. But what I've tried really hard to do is think about where they're coming from. What is their lived experience? Maybe this is how they were treated and they don't know any better. Maybe this is what they think they need to do to get ahead. And what I have found in a lot of these situations, for me especially, which is hard because I hate conflict, but is I try really hard to talk to those people. So if I think somebody is either directly or indirectly doing something to hurt me, I will often sit down and I will say, hey, you know, can we talk? Is something is something going on? Did I do something to upset you? Or if, it, if you don't even feel comfortable doing that, sometimes I'll bring them into a project that I'm working on. Or I will say, I would love your advice on this. You've done this before. Or I love your guidance. I, I'd love your opinion on this. And so by making them feel like they're a part of what you're doing, even if, you know, you may not want to work with them, but giving them that opportunity to maybe see you for who you are. Because one thing I've seen a lot of times is I've had women who have written me off because they think I sound too young or I sound too excited or I sound too bubbly. And so they think of me in a certain way, but then when they'll get me in a different venue and they hear me speak or they hear me lead, then they come up to me and they'll say, holy cow, you're totally different than the impression I had of you. So remember, we all use implicit bias to lead our lives. It's very possible that these people may not be doing this intentionally and it might be just their perceptions of you. There, now, that being said, I'm not a Pollyanna. There's going to be times where there's people who just aren't nice. That is the way the world works. And if that's the case, then you know that you need to still be kind and nice to those people, but you also need to stand up for yourself. You also need to know who your friends are, who your enemies are, and who those people are that are going to be on your side. Don't make enemies. Don't go out of your way. If somebody's mean to you, don't be mean back, but stand up for yourself and realize that to have people realize you're not going to get pushed around. And the biggest thing, this uh, Dr. Vinny Aurora, who's on here, has taught me this, which I think is so important. You need to find your allies and you need to find allies who have your best interest at heart. You need to go to them when you need help. Don't try to do this alone and find the important stakeholders in anything that you're doing and get them on your side before you start trying to navigate anything. Because once you have allies who have more power than you or who have more influence than you or who have more connections than you, it's going to help you navigate all of these things a lot better. So that, that, collection of people who can help you navigate the situations will really help you. But again, give people grace, especially during this pandemic. I think I've probably snapped at people more than I ever have in my life, probably my family more than anything. But you need to make sure that you are you don't don't write people off the way they might write you off, give them a chance. And then make sure that you're not using your preconceived implicit bias or notions about who you think they are to guide how you interact with them. But again, if there's somebody who's just not nice, then just realize that and then realize that where you need to put them in your panel of people. Are they somebody that you rely on for certain things or you just completely write them off? Are they somebody who is going to have an impact on your career? Do you need to have a way to engage with them and figure out how to navigate that accordingly? Put them in the place that you need them to be in that will help you achieve what you want to achieve. Shika, thank you so much for that answer. And Anna, you're welcome to hang out. I want to make sure we get to the rest of our speakers. But again, you're welcome to hang out if you wind up having another question. So in order, um, I would like to invite back Dr. Gupta, who I think I invited back and then she, I either had to split. But anyway, we have you back. Welcome to the conversation. And thank you for joining us. Hi, is this me, Vinita Gupta? It is you. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. First of all, congratulations on this space. And it's just amazing to hear all of you and just that being in the presence of all of you. And I think that uh, I want to just comment on the women uh, issue a little bit and then go to my original point that I wanted to talk to. I think um, Shika mentioned, Dr. Shika mentioned a lot of strategies on how to uh, kind of uh, address that or deal with it. And in addition, I would suggest keeping in mind the uh, structural issue and hierarchical and the historical um, power dynamics that we as women grow into. Uh, 
So keeping that in mind with like spaces like this, it seems it not may not seem as big, but this is going to have a big impact. Conversations like this the, that would make us not feel threatened by each other and kind of climbing up the ladder by using the methods that power structures set us up for uh, as men and then gender preferences in our society. So I think to keeping that big picture in mind is also helpful. And I also wanted to reinforce um, what, again, two of the speakers uh, before also talked about how women physician and their um, equity, health equity, and all that not only affect their own, I mean, gender equity, not only impact um, the cadre itself, but at their patients and larger community. And as we know, the U.S., the uh, maternal mortality has been on the rise. So it's not just an isolated situation there. So I'm just excited, very excited, and I'm kind of sharing from uh, <laughs> wall to wall on that. And um, I'm a global health, uh, health equity, um, passionate advocate. Uh, who practiced maternal and child health for over 10 years and then did my human rights, international human rights law from Notre Dame. And I try to combine both in the work that I do on global health. So thank you. Thank you for giving me opportunity to talk today. Very, very honored to have you join that conversation and appreciate your comments and am just bewildered by your incredible expertise and background. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I want to then welcome um, Revolution to this conversation. Thank you for joining us tonight. Hey, Stephanie. Uh, I love seeing where you pop up, where Stephanie is. Good stuff is happening and uh, <laughs> um, so awesome. I got to follow Stephanie for the good stuff. Uh, you know me, Stephanie, right? I interview people. So no need to go into detail, but my family's going through hell right now with a with a parent uh, on a, on a ventilator and um so i have had uh this seven day experience of i'm very good in making sure my dad gets the best care uh you know I, I i know how to get things done and my dad is my dad is getting that but i've been talking to a lot of nurses social workers uh physicians assistants i'm talking to haggard people and so the first thing I want to just say to all of you in the profession, uh, Dr. Bloomgarden and, and all of the doctors and the nurses, Ashley's in here. Ashley and I know each other a little bit and um, that there are billions of us who, <laughs> sorry, give me a sec. Um, who are, it's okay. Who, who, yeah, who are there for you and appreciate the hell out of you and uh, and just really, really do. And that women are getting out of this um, this field in droves or men or whoever. I mean, I can't blame them. I've heard the stories about how people have been treated. I know, and Dr. M down there too, right? I, you know, you all know what's happening. But what I wanted to say was, I kind of wanted to interject this in here, was one of the things that I think is really positive about um, women and women physicians and women in medicine and women in, in the sciences is in the only category of, of higher education that women are not more prevalent than men is the hard sciences. And within a few years, that will change. In fact, we're already probably at a crisis point for young men in college. So that said, in the long term, and I'm going to be a little silly here, but it'll be maybe we'll get a laugh. I think men are just going to lazy themselves out of power because women are starting to fill these roles and men are like, ah, shit. well, excuse me, sorry. You know, I, they, women won't get me dinner anymore, but God, if they could just go to work and do the hard shit, I'll just stay home, right? So um, that's, again, a little bit over the top, but it's really true. And so for me, the thing I really wanted to do was bring this positive thing, because women are still, I posted it when I tweeted out about this, you know, there's a crisis in uh, in pay gap with, with uh, women in medicine and everything. But really, what I wanted to come up here to do is is just be able to to, to let everybody know, because I heard it that you need allies and allies need to listen and allies need to get involved and listen and find out what role the folks they're trying to support would like them to do. So as an ally in this, and you don't even have to answer it now because I know I've thrown a lot at, at you even, um, Dr. Uh, Bloomgarden, but you know, I just want people to know that as an ally, we need to get involved too. And Stephanie, seriously, I'm stoked. This is just 
amazing. And please, everybody, because, uh, you know, now I am a host. Look how big this room is. Let's triple it. All right. Just get out there and DM the heck out of everybody. Retweet everything. Call your moms. For, I'm serious. Call your healthcare worker friends. Call them on the phone if you have to and get them a link. And I will be quiet because I know I've taken way more time than I should have. Oh, Go my ahead, goodness. <laughs> I was, you know, I, I just wanted to thank you so much. Um for sharing your story. And I, you know, we, I follow you as well. And I know, I know you're going through hell right now. And the fact that you um, have it in you to even come to our space and to share and to not just share what you're, what you're seeing, but to try and empower our movement and our mission is just, is so moving. And it just, it like almost brings me to tears because I, I just, I, I'm so grateful that you're here. Um, and I, I wish that, uh, that, things were, were different for you and your family. And, and I really am, am hopeful, you know, that, that everyone recovers, but thank you for your comment and thank you for being here and know that allies, um, we appreciate allies, but we really, we just really appreciate kind of this space and the, the vulnerability that you brought here. And, um, you know, just know that we are all thinking about you. Thank you, Eve. Um, uh, I think yeah, sorry, for oh, all sorry, of us. Sorry, no, go ahead, Rev. Go ahead. I had, was on mute, and I was just thanking you, and uh, and I, yeah, just um, I really do appreciate it. And look, you know, it's just um, we are just really lucky in this first world country, is as much as we have been going through, and we should not have had very many deaths beyond you know a thou a few thousand, I you know ultimately, but it is what it is, and uh, and just that, yeah, um, I just I've seen. Um, what everybody has learned over the last two years. I mean, I interview folks just like you and talk about these things. So uh, just absolutely amazing. Much love to you. Stephanie, I can drop down if you need the space for sure. And uh, yeah, thanks again. We really appreciate you joining us. And again, you know, my thoughts and prayers are with your family, Rev. And thank you for being such an ally just in public health in general, um, fighting disinformation around vaccines. You're, you're such a, you're just a really special man. And we are very much thinking of you. So thank you for joining us and having this conversation Dr. Parekh, I hope I hope I said your name wrong or right. I hope I said it right. I'm sorry. I'm monitoring my back channel. I am so happy that you joined us here this evening. I'm sorry. I hope I didn't ruin your name. So no, no, to have you my, join the conversation. Uh, thank you so much for having me. My first name is uh, Rulan. It's like Mulan with an R, and my last name is Parekh. And so Parekh, um, great. Yeah. So no, you did it great. And this is the first time I've done something like this, or at least spoken at something like this. So thanks so much. And if I screwed up, I. Uh, I'll hopefully be able to get back on. Um, I'm really interested um, in um, in this area, and I, I'd like to sort of um, ask some questions and, and sort of get feedback from everyone. I'm the Vice President for Research, Education, and Innovation at Women's College Hospital here in Toronto and part of the University of Toronto. And I really am worried about this pipeline and the leaky pipeline. And what I'm trying to do is really try to figure out what are the – numbers and what are the things that I could do in order to be able to help people along this pathway from early career, I'm primarily in science, um, early career clinician scientists to late career um, where I can get them promoted and into leadership. And so often people just currently measure and we have counts and we say, well, we've got 10 women out of 40 or but what I'd like to do is actually try to figure out what are the numbers that I could follow. And I think what I'm trying to understand from uh, from people's perspectives is what would make you trust your department chair, your division head and institution that they're really doing the best for you and for women? Are there numbers that you would want to see on a, an annual basis, on a regular basis that would make you feel like people are actually watching out for things like salary equity, uh, gender discrepancies in salary. So what are the things that people want to take a look at and that would make you feel good about the institution that you're at? So I can I can answer that first. First, thank you for joining. And don't worry, Rulan, this is my first Twitter spaces as well, even though I'm a co-host of this event. So don't worry, you're doing just as well, if not better than I am. So. Okay, thanks. <laughs> um, I think there's a couple of things. It's obviously a multifactorial issue, but the first thing, and I don't know um, if it's different in Canada, but pay transparency here in the United States is impossible to get. So I think 
finding out if it's possible to have that type of pay transparency and to make sure that you're paying people equitably, I think is really important. The second thing I think that's really, really important, and this is why we, one of the reasons we have such a leaky pipeline is women often get relegated to these in, invisible tasks, these community tasks that are really important for organizations and important for the growth of systems and research projects and research programs, but they don't really give you that, if you're in academia, they don't give you that academic currency you know, they take away time from being able to publish or give talks and things like that. And to be honest, you don't get paid for that stuff either. And so I think being really intentional and who is being approached to do that type of kind of community type work and making sure that's distributed equitably. And then not only when you're distributing that work equitably, if you if you are able to provide some return on investment for that type of work. So one thing that we do with women in medicine is anytime I make somebody or I ask somebody to join a committee, I make sure there's something that they get out of it. So if it's a student, it'll be a recommendation letter or mentorship. If it's a trainee or, or a student or young faculty, it's a paper where they will join a committee, but they're not just doing the committee work because we need that work done for the organization. They also will get some benefit that is what is needed for them at that point in their career. If it's somebody in more senior leadership, they might not need papers. They might need connections. So I make sure that I, I help them find the connections that they need because in my opinion, and I think this has been studied as well, a lot of times what happens is women get relegated to this work that's necessary and then they get no benefit from it. And so if you look intentionally at your organization and you really do a deep dive into who is doing what kind of work and why are these people not advancing? Why is there a leaky pipeline in your institution? And then make intentional changes and realize, okay, well, this person can't do 7 a.m. meetings because they have to drop off their kids in the morning. Or this person is taking care of their elderly parents in the evening. They have to go, you know, they've got to take care of them so they can't do a meeting at this time. Ask people why they're having challenges meeting whatever goals and then figure out what fat you can cut away that they don't need to be doing. And if they don't have fat that needs to be cut away, figure out how other people can support them or sponsor them. Because a lot of times women get overlooked because they aren't at that, you know, event in the evening. And so that's when it was discussed that there was a great speaking opportunity. Or maybe you're you're just going to the same people over and over again because you know they're reliable and you trust them, but you don't look outside of your circle. We see this especially for women who have intersectional identities. So um, women of color, women who have, you know, the minority tax, women with double, triple, quadruple burdens. We see this a lot where oftentimes they get asked to do the same things over and over again, and they do it because they know it's what's right and what needs to be done, but then they're sacrificing doing other work. So I think looking at those metrics within your institution and figuring out why do we have a leaky pipeline? Why are these, what are the barriers in place that are preventing these people from fulfilling the tasks that would help them advance in their careers and then removing those barriers or assigning those roles to other people who may be not having those barriers, who may not keep volunteering for committees because they're a good person, but they, they know that they need that research paper to get promoted. So I think doing a really deep dive and being intentional, I don't think it's a numbers thing. I don't want to say you need 50% women in leadership. I think it's more you need to be intentional in realizing how are you advancing people? How are you supporting and sponsoring people to advance? And how are you making sure that you are removing the barriers for them? And that is the kind of place that I personally would want to work. Eve, I think you had a comment as well. Yes, I want to say, you know, I think this is really one of the areas that women really exceed when um, in leadership, in their leadership capacity, which is, you know, asking these questions and then wanting to take action to kind of to make changes. And so, I mean, I'm, I'm confident in your leadership abilities because you just asked this question. And I think one of the things this really brings up is just be, having high emotional intelligence and understanding how to lead with empathy. Um, and it's it's something that I think it has been um, it, that comes more intuitively to some of us than others and, um, you know, and can certainly uh, hold hold some of us back who are empaths to our detriment. But I think it is something when you look at the institutional levels or these big organizations, having empathy, listening to your uh, to your employees, to everybody that is in your organization, really finding out how what what what's going on, what makes them want to stay, what makes them leave, focusing on retention, focusing on value and on respect, um, you know, things that really um, aren't necessarily measured in in dollar values, but are measured in in intention to leave or intention to stay. Um, and it, it really does boil down to making people feel wanted and making them feel like they belong and valued, um, especially now after two years of, of what we've been, you know, going through with 
with the pandemic, I think it's, it's, it couldn't be more important. Um, and it's hard to teach empathy, but it can be taught. And certainly um, there's even a role for perceived empathy. And um, I, I think as more and more women move up the ranks and, and are at the table, we'll see that kind of evolve more naturally. Thank you. And Rulon, you, I know you're new to Twitter spaces. I apologize that I actually muted you twice. And the only reason I did that is there was some background noise in the, so I just needed you to mute so we could actually hear what they were saying. But um, did that answer your question, Rulon? Yeah, no, it did. And I'm sorry, I was typing what they were saying so that I could make sure I kept track of it all. So thanks <laughs> no, so much. I, um, no I, do have, I do have one sort of follow-up question that was, um, and, and this is primarily for, I think, within academic medicine is, this idea of impact, and we currently use bibliometrics to say that people have been impactful. And so how many papers have you published? How many times has it been cited? But I'm interested in understanding what other people think about impact and what could be measured in order to show that what a lot of women have done is really impactful in terms of their mentorship, in terms of their supporting students, supporting teams, um, changing policy guidelines. So I was just wondering what any of you thought about that. Uh, Eve, I'll let you go first on that one. Oh my gosh, I was in the back channel. Um, people are sending me messages. So I, I might defer back to you on that one. Um, or if we could repeat the question, I'm so sorry. No, go ahead. Shika, go ahead, because we have quite a long, uh, a long line of um, um, speakers. So go ahead, Shika, and then I'm going to move to our next, um, to our next uh, uh, speaker. Go ahead. So if I understand your question, Rulon, you were basically asking, how do we do this? Is that right? Yeah. What do you think about what other measures of impact beyond bibliometrics do you think would be important for promotion? I think we need to be looking at people engaging on social media. I think that's huge because we found that that's a great way to educate. And Mayo has actually um, created an entire space where um, you can actually do promotions in social media. And uh, Dr. Vinny Aurora and Dr. Mark Shapiro, who I think is in this space, and I and a couple of our colleagues have actually published a paper on how you can utilize um, the, your CV uh, to uh, amplify what you do on social media. So I think that's number one. Um, I think also a lot of the education that we do now is not just giving keynote lectures at conferences and academic conferences, writing op-eds, doing media appearances, talking to the news, talking to the community, grassroots efforts, working in a nonprofit. Those are all things that I think are really, really important and should all be counted towards promotion because in these this day and age, in academia especially, we need to branch out and break away from the way the hierarchical structure was before. We launched the Women in Medicine Speakers Bureau this week specifically to provide those types of opportunities to women. And I'm hopeful that we will start to see those types of things in the promotion packets of people who are advancing in their careers in academia. Yeah, and one of the things I'll say now that I'm back and listening and not looking at my DMs um, is is that um, this is some of the work that, that Shika and I have done, um, in particular with many people in these groups, is we, we actually started another another uh, organization as well called IMPACT, which is the Illinois Medical Professional Action Collaborative Team. And we are a grassroots advocacy organization that really um, promotes um, evidence-based information uh, about the pandemic. And we talk, um, you know, we communicate with our policymakers, we communicate with the general public, and we also empower and, and speak for our, our fellow healthcare workers. So there's a lot that is very, very meaningful, very impactful, uh, very much speaks to communi community advocacy and is worthy in, of promotion and recognition that we is not really built into our system. And so I think really thinking a little bit more progressively and thinking outside the box as what truly has impact, you know, what when you're looking at uh, national recognition or local or regional recognition for things like that, these things all matter. And um, we can we can tweet out our, our CV matrix or what um, what Shika was talking about, about things that should count in terms of COVID times, but really should count moving forward um, as, as what really matters uh, when it comes to what we're valuing in, in the Institute of Medicine here. So I think it's such an excellent question and I don't, I don't think the answer has fully been, um, has fully been realized yet, but we are, we are certainly working on it. And I think um, we will, we'll try and share the link through the spaces. Thanks so much. Eve. Thank you, thank you, Lon, for joining us. Really appreciate it. Elizabeth and um, and Marilyn, you have both been waiting very, very patiently. Marilyn, I will go to you. Then Eve, I will go to you. We have Elisa next, and you are also a doctor. Forgive me, I'm going by your first names. And then um, Dr. Gupta, if you could hang with us for just a minute, as I'd like to get to the rest of the speakers based on the fact that we're just heading towards about 15 minutes towards the top of the hour. Um, I appreciate that. Marilyn, thank you for your patience and welcome to the conversation. 
Um, I am really thrilled um, to have this event and really commend the organization. Uh, <clears throat> I am currently the division chief of of pulmonary critical care and sleep at the University of Arizona and spent 27 years at the University of Miami, where I pioneered way back the maternity and paternity policies and things and have really appreciated all of our struggles for the women here. And I just wanted to point out a couple of things. One is the Harvard B School uh, review on why so many women are quitting by uh, Dudley, McLaughlin, and Lee. Uh, I would encourage everyone to read this. It's a phenomenal piece. Um, it lacks some of the data you might like to see, but the whole intent about you know what makes it different and why is it happening, they discuss alignment, resilience, and intent to stay. And I, I think we've heard some of that on this conversation that we got to make it so it's good for the women to stay and we need to reward them. And in reference to um, Rui's uh, comment, we've come up with a composite index for promotion that we've, we've been managing to put through the Promotion and Tenures Committee by getting more women tenured that sit on the committee. And then the other thing is just a piece of good news from um, this doesn't address my colleagues in Canada but it addresses what's happening in U.S. medical schools. Um, I will join Loyola in July 1st as the chair of medicine, uh, the Clark chair, and I will be accompanied there by the chair of surgery, who's a woman, and the chair of pathology. And I'm enormously proud to be joining such an organization. But I wanted to draw attention to the double AMC data that should give us some hope. If you look at the data from... Uh, down, you know, as, as far back as, uh, you know, in the 90s to 2021, what we see is a decrease in men becoming chairs and an increase in women. That doesn't mean the data is great, folks, but at least 22 percent are rising to the senior ranks. And I think we would all agree that the more we can keep pushing to be in those senior ranks is where we make the difference. And we make the difference for the rest of us. And when people ask me, what was this, you know, what's the deal about becoming a chair? I said, this is such a wonderful piece of news for women in medicine. And whatever I can do um, to continue to further, you know, the real asset of having women uh, in leadership positions and really changing the face like Eve and Shia, I, I, I just say all of us on this call, it's a, it's a really pat on the back that we're all doing this. And anything I can do, I'm happy to keep going. Thank you. Marilyn, thank you so much. Congratulations, <laughs> first of all. Amazing. Love your passion and enthusiasm. And what I love underneath it is passion, enthusiasm, and I can hear that grit and that commitment to ensuring that we continue to carve paths, mentorship, and allyship for women in medicine. I just love your spirit. So Thank you so much for joining this conversation and adding that I, I, incredible. I'm really very happy value. to be here. With that. Thank you so much. We feel it, and we certainly, certainly appreciate it. And I would like to welcome Elisa. I am calling you by your first name. Let me let me say Doctor Elisa because I can also tell. I would much prefer to hear you pronounce your own last name, so I don't do anything to it. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, welcome. Stephanie. Thanks so much, everyone, for hosting the space this is so great on this very important day um my uh my last name is nix um it's one syllable everyone gets it wrong the first time don't Thank worry you. about it <laughs> um i'm i'm so excited to like hear all of these ideas because i think um as a female physician who has done a lot of different things um i'm a pediatric electrophysiologist by training um I have done industry work. I still do industry work. I still practice. Um, I've done nonprofit work. Um, and I, I really, it resonates with me so much to hear um, women start thinking out of the box about their passion, their, their, where medicine sits in their life, not where they sit in medicine. <laughs> and uh, and that's such such an important concept to me because I think that our d identities and um, our self concept is wrapped up in our profession so many times that we don't make time for um, things that we feel might be risky to do, and that mindset really. Um, was handicapped 
it, I mean, not to be it. It was it was a handicap for me. It, it really was a limiting thing for me for many years. Um, and I would say that, uh, you know, what I really feel is missing are partnerships between institutions of you know, academic institutions as well as other schools, other programs within the same, under the same university umbrella to help um, engage women in medicine, especially uh, providing management training. I think that's something that I feel I lacked. Um, and I think we all know of somebody that we have worked with or under uh, where we wish there were better management skills um, to help promote um, a better work environment, to help enable people to grow in their in their profession, enable in advancement, facilitate research, et cetera. And well, I, Lisa, it sounds like you're a great candidate to join women in medicine. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I think that it was it was a revelation when I actually kind of made the leap to do, you know, um, a, a, a larger portion of my time with a number of really innovative projects. And I think that I think that people are discouraged from doing that. And I think um, I think men, frankly, have a hard, uh, an easier time taking those risks and getting more support for doing it than women do. And and so I just want to let everyone know that I've done it, <laughs> um, and it's possible. And 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 not to kind of advertise non clinical work, but um, you know, it, it did get me up in the morning when I was burned out, and it 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 did kind of save me um, in so many ways. And so I just want to share that you know just to kind of think about things that can help women um, who are interested in, in just an enormous amount of, 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 of things in their lives um, that they can thrive better practicing medicine by virtue of having those opportunities. Go ahead, Eve. Yes, I, I wanted to thank you and also um, to say that I think about it just how you described it, just filling filling my bucket. So why do I do this? Why do why do, are we doing all of this, um, you know, advocacy work, equity work, uh, gender equity and, um, you know, COVID-19 work? Why are we doing all this media work and things that aren't directly clinical? And a lot of it is, you know, taking one bucket to fill the other um, in, a, in a sense, it, it really helps me stave off burnout. But I, I think it's not a foolproof method. And certainly we've all been victims of biting off more than we can chew. And so I, I think there's a balance needs, we need to be aware of our own limits and make sure that we're not over committing. Um, but I, I really appreciate your perspective on this. Um, and I also just wanted to kind of toot my own horn because I figured out how to tweet something from within our space. So I did um, share the uh, the COVID-19 kind of CV matrix for, <laughs> I see you laughing, for um, ac accounting for academic productivity uh, during the pandemic. Um, so I'm really excited that I figured that out. <laughs> <laughs> no, no doubt, Elisa. Thank you for joining the conversation. And um, Dr. Gupta, you had your hand up and then I would like to move to Dr. Jesse Allen. If you would hang in there with us, please, Dr. Gupta. Thank you. Vinita is better. Um, so I want to just quickly reflect on Dr. Rula Parikh's uh, comment, uh, question from very DI, somebody who has worked on DEI and South North um, Power Dynamic Partnerships. So I want to reflect on two things. One is the uh, career growth or professional growth in academics. Uh, it's, I think, clinical excellence is, of course, is. Um, crucial, but I think the work with the health equity is inescapable uh, truth that we all need to be mindful and uh, some degree of expertise on understanding it and bringing it to our work. So I think those opportunities should be available, whether it's through volunteers, whether it's working through the global health or whichever way, opportunities should be available and that should be measured that how 
people are contributing or the physicians are contributing towards the health equity quotient, moving it further. And then the second one, the women's uh, number, I think that um, as other speakers mentioned also, that number is not the only thing. So when we talk about who's at the table, how they are brought on the table, where um, where the table is, and then how people leave the table, how do they feel when they leave the table, all those things are important. Because otherwise we run into the risk of running women's representation as tokenism. Right. So we bring in women, we just check the box. And I've seen that over and over again in 30 years of my career, how that becomes counterproductive. So I think looking at when we bring the women that um, leaders to at different levels and different roles that it's reflected um, uh, in age, color, race, diversity, backgrounds, as all those things are taken into consideration that everybody gets the opportunity. And then how voices, their voices are um, in, a, in a conducive environment where they can freely share those voices. Otherwise, I've, I, I worked for ACOG, American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists as their global technical director. So you could be sitting in the table with white men board, the whole board with senior white men, and then you may not say a single word. But then the question mark is checked. There's a brown woman who's this and that and it's fine, but actually you're, there was no environment for your voice. So I just want to emphasize that. Thank you again. Benita, thank you. Those are incredibly important points that you are making. And again, uh, very much value what you are contributing to this conversation. I would like to move next to Dr. Jesse Allen. Welcome to the conversation. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you fine. You're just a little bit far away. I don't know if that's an issue of volume on your phone or if you can get your voice a little bit closer, but we're, sure, we're surely trying. You're just a little low. Oh, okay. Well, I, I'm joining here from the hospital. So if I'm, if I'm loud, feel free to mute me. And No way. You're forgiven and you get to, no, you're here. You are all here. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for this space. And thank you, Eve and Chica. Um, I, I have a question for the two of you. What I would love to know is, how do you make all of the work that you do for gender equity, how do you make this sustainable for uh, the two of you? I happen to know that you both work full clinical work. You have very busy personal lives. Knowing that the change is slow and that the mountain ahead is big and may have gotten bigger over the pandemic, how do you make this sustainable work uh, for those of us also in this space who who want to keep moving forward but hit roadblocks and know that it's a long road ahead, where do you get your energy and how do you compassionately take care of yourselves? So I'm going to, I'm going to take this first because I think it's so important for you guys to all understand something. All of us are exhausted and it happens. And I've wanted to give up so many times. I can't even tell you how many times I've wanted to give up. What keeps me going forward, what makes me want to keep doing this is honestly people like you, Jesse, people like Eve, people who I talk to, my friends, my community. But then more than that, there have been days where I've wanted to completely give up and shutter my doors and say, I just want to sleep and I want to be a mom and I want to stay home and I don't want to work anymore. I'm just tired because it feels like nothing I'm doing matters. Nothing is making a difference. And I will get fortuitously an email or a tweet or a text or something where someone will say, Dr. Jane or Shika, you have no idea what your leadership programming did for me or your summit did for me, or you put out a tweet today that really resonated with me. And so that is one thing that keeps me going is hearing from amazing women and not just about stuff I'm doing, but hearing about what stuff other people are doing. Like somebody would tell me, have you met Jesse Allen? She is such a huge advocate and she does such incredible work. And then I'll text you and I'll say, Hey Jesse, did you know people are talking about how amazing you are? So it's not just the things that I hear about myself. It's the things I hear about my friends who are also doing this work. And that is what keeps me going. Now, that being said, I do get exhausted. I do get tired and I do get discouraged. And when that happens, I take a break. I take a break. I spend time with my family. I get off social media. I have a glass of wine. I go for a run. I do whatever I need to do, whether it's for an hour or a day or a week or a month, because this work will still be here when I get back. It's not that 
Um, I need to be doing it 24 seven. It's hard for me, for those of you who know me personally, it's hard for me not to be doing it 24 seven, but you really have to know what your limits are and what your boundaries are because there, this work will always be there for you. It'll be there for you, whether you take a month, a year, five years away from it. You just need to make sure you're also doing what's best for you and your mental health. And especially knowing you, you're a hospitalist, you're working in the hospital, you're taking care of, you know, sick patients, and it's exhausting just doing our regular jobs. So do this stuff as long as it keeps you passionate and engaged and excited. And if it's not doing that for you, either take a break or talk to your friends, text somebody, find out what you need to do to make yourself whole. Because if it's not making you whole, don't do it. Because you need to worry about yourself and your family first. Everybody else is just as important and to, to multiple initiatives. A lot of people are working on this stuff. You need to focus on making sure you take care of yourself. Yeah, I'll just echo that and say the, the finding your team and finding, you know, your people is, is really, is really so important and knowing who to go to when you're feeling overwhelmed and, or who you can turn to, to, to take the baton and, you know, who you can pass the baton to and keep going. Um, it is really key because there's so much to do in this space and there's so much to do in so many of the things that we're all passionate about. But if you're not, um, if you're not fully present and you are overcommitted or you're, it's, if it's pulling away from your family time or from your time at your job and it's causing more stress, then you're not really doing the work is it's not going to, you're not going to be as impactful anyway. And so, I mean, I think it's really about knowing kind of like who you can lean on, but also just, you know, not biting, not take bite, you know, biting off more than you can chew. And it's a balance. And what really matters is having people who can just be straight up with you about if you're, if you're in over your head. And so, you know, this is like my 14th conversation with Shika today, probably. And I think we had 20 yesterday. So like, we can, we can be honest with each other about that. And it's to find a buddy who, who you can just, you know, know is very reliable and is going to tell you what you need to hear. I think I see Amisha in here and she also is, um, she'll, she'll tell me what I need to hear in the moment, no matter what. <laughs> Thank you so much. And Jesse, take, take care of yourself. This is a very hard time um, for physicians to take care of themselves. Nurses, anyone who is in medicine right now, very, very challenging. So thank you for the work that you're doing. And please do take care. And with that, I would like to invite Dr. Perry to join the conversation. Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Um, I have a couple of things to say. I'll, be, I'll make it short. I am currently, um, I'm a family physician by training. I currently am retired, uh, medically retired, forced out. And uh, I have the first thing I want to say is that um, be somewhere they, they will appreciate you. You know, find, find your niche and work in a place where they will appreciate you, not just not tolerate you, but appreciate you and welcome your input. That is key. Uh, and the second thing is um, know when the environment changes, when it's time for you to move on. I came to a, in a position uh, and I had, was, had an interim chair and uh, they did a search and we all assumed that the interim chair would be made uh, the permanent chair. And they did a nationwide search and they brought someone else in and the permanent chair uh, decided to reorganize the department and he wanted uh, younger people in the department. So <laughs> uh, since I was uh, over the age of 60 um, and I had a medical incident and while I was out on sick leave, when I came back, um, they had decided to medically retire me. Uh, so uh, that's why I'm saying knowing, know when the environment shifts and you can go out on your own terms and not be enforced or um, made so uncomfortable that you would, you know, have to leave. Recognize the signs of changing in, in the community and in, in, in the milieu uh, uh, of the uh, department. Thank you, Dr. Perry, for joining the conversation. Shika and Eve, do you have any thoughts for Dr. Perry on what she just mentioned? Well, I first want to say I'm so sorry that happened to you. I mean, that just sounds awful. And the saddest thing is you are not the first person I've heard a story like that from. And that is a huge part of the reason why we've created these types of spaces, why we have these types of communities, because this type of thing is unacceptable. And the fact that it happened to you, I just, I just want to tell you, I'm so sorry. And I agree that 
sometimes it's hard for us to, to see the signs. Uh, sometimes it's hard to identify those things. And so, you know, it's, having that community is so important. But even sometimes when you have that community, you, you don't see what's happening. So I 100% agree with you. You need to be in an environment and an institution that values you. Um, there is a phrase that I can't remember. I'm going to paraphrase it here, but it's your job will never love you back. Um, and so one thing that I try to remind myself of is I try to focus on the things, like I said, that, that keep me happy and keep me grounded. But in situations like that, I mean, that's just, that's just awful. And I, I'm so sorry that happened to you. And I wish that, I wish that that hadn't happened to you and that that didn't happen to so many women out there. And, you know, hopefully, hopefully things will start to change and continue to change as we, as we move the needle on these things. But that's just, I mean, that's just really, really awful. I'm so sorry. Agreed. And I just wanted to thank you uh, for your courage for sharing uh, that here in this space. Um, you know, and I think um, our, part of what part of be, women in medicine is we really we're trying to bring people bring the stories together in a way that really paints a larger picture of what's going on so that you don't feel so alone in these things. Um, and I, I just, you know, I think there is so much there's so much to unpack about your situation um, that that uh, we could have a whole separate spaces on um, uh, on discrimination and, and inequities and, and what what really what work really needs to be done around that so that things like this aren't aren't tolerated and and you know never happen and um, you know I just so much empathy and uh, and thank you for sharing that I really appreciate it. Dr. Perry, thank you so much for joining this space. And um, I just want to say as, as a mom, as an advocate, um, thank you for your service to your fellow human beings in the practice of medicine. Um, we need you. We need, we need everybody uh, to come to the table. Um, and, and certainly, I think we need to do more spaces on the benefit of women in medicine and some of the unique characteristics that women do bring to medicine. And certainly, Dr. Perry, it looks like you're doing some work in the um, DEI space and some others. And so your contribution to the whole world is important. And so we are full of women here in this space tonight and men who are allies who are here to support you. And again, I echo the um, appreciation for your vulnerability and your honesty in bringing this up as this clearly is an issue that Shika has seen, that Eve has seen, um, and it's important. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. Marilyn, it looks like you requested to rejoin the conversation. Um, we are heading towards a little past the top of the hour. So as we as we move towards um, wrap up this evening, um, we welcome you back um, as we head towards the final uh, the final time for the space. Thanks, Marilyn. Your phone could no, have I, no, I, 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 I did <laughs> okay. it, but I, I just I, once again, I just echo how marvelous this is. This is just we need to do more of this. We need to do this at different centers, you know, where we can bring more of the women together and where we can all get together. But I, I think there's a lot of benefit. There's a lot of benefit in identifying the problems and coming up with working action plans. I completely agree with you. And Eve and Shika, I would like to come back to you as we head towards the wrap up of this space in terms of uh, parting thoughts that you both have um, in the work you're doing. And I would like you to um, both, as we do wrap up, make a plug for Women in Medicine. For those of you who are joining us here in the audience, we encourage you to follow Women in Medicine. Um, they, uh, their, um, their Twitter handle is in this space right now. It's a 501c3. And you have physicians here who are women who are deeply involved. And we have men who are allies of this organization as well. If you have found this conversation beneficial, helpful and just a warm fuzzy blanket for everybody who needs support please do follow um, all of the women here and follow each other back um, collaboration um, partnership support is is all such a huge part of just getting through life together let alone this very challenging time in medicine so shika any of i will hand this over to you for some wrap-up thoughts um, as we wrap up the end of this fantastic space Thank you, Stephanie, and thank you for being such an awesome host and um, and friend. So I just wanted to say we'll definitely do a part two, and we um, you know we'll we'll dive a little bit deeper into some of our programming. I did post inside of our space that we this week uh, launched the first of its kind Women in Medicine Speakers Bureau, um, with the uh, goal to basically eliminate the sentence that we just couldn't find a qualified woman. So um, we would love to invite um, all, all of the women um, doctors and physicians here to join and to, to, to apply for our speakers uh, bureau because it's really, it's a novel thing. It's never been done before. And really we're, we're able to showcase our expertise. 
We also have an annual summit in September this year, which we're hoping is going to be in person and it's been virtual for the last two years, but it will be in Chicago in September and it, all of that information is available if you're following us on social media. And um, additionally, we have lots of leadership accelerator programs that um, we have a, a, a inclusive leadership lab for men intended to um, uh, basically allow for how to be an ally, how they can really serve gender equity in um, a very tangible and actionable way. It'll be our second year. So any any men listening or anyone who, who knows somebody who wants to get involved, please sign up for our inclusive leadership lab because it's also a unique experience that really is not um, is not available elsewhere. We have a mid-career uh, longitudinal program for uh, leadership development. We have a, um, a early career longitudinal program. We have a research lab. We have um, lots happening in our in the organization um, that uh, is now a nonprofit. And so, anyone who wants to get involved, please. Our DMs are open. Please message us. Please follow us. Um, reach out because we don't know you if you don't know us yet, and we don't know what you have to offer. But we know it's awesome, and so um, we are. We're always looking for more for more people who are really motivated to, um, to make some changes. And, you know, we're, we're very motivated, but we, we need, we need help and we're not, um, we're not able to do it on our own. So I will then pass the baton to our fearless leader, Shika. Wow, Eve, I'm impressed you managed to cover all of our programming in that short amount of time. That is super impressive. <laughs> Kudos to you. Um, so the two things I will add to that. So the Speakers Bureau is open to any women in healthcare, so you don't need to be a physician to be in the Speakers Bureau. So if you're a nurse, if you're a healthcare administrator, whatever you are, if you're working in healthcare in any capacity, please apply to be on the Speakers Bureau. And same thing for the Male Inclusive Leadership Lab. It's for all men in healthcare. You don't need to be a physician. So if you know of a male who is working in the healthcare, healthcare space who you think could benefit from um, taking this inclusive leadership program. It's not because it's an us versus them situation. Gender equity will not be achieved in healthcare until we all work together. Um, Women in Medicine was really founded because I believe in collaboration, not competition. Probably why I went into medicine and I'm not a business person. Um, I'm all about collaborating and working together. And I really don't think we're going to be able to make a dent in this until, um, until we all work together. So I am just blessed and honored and I'm always flabbergasted by the amazing men and women that I meet when I do this type of work and I would not be able to do any of this work without the incredible incredible women and men who have come before me and the people who are on our steering committee and I mean the leaders in healthcare right now are really pushing for this so I just want to leave you all with a parting thought which I tell everybody whenever I do any of these things which is each of us can make a difference whether it's relating to misinformation and convincing someone to get a vaccine or whether it's advocating for equity, whether it's in your own job or in your friend's job or in your own physician's job, who knows? Maybe maybe your physician is a woman physician and, and wants someone to talk to about this kind of thing. There's so many ways that you can make a difference whether you're in healthcare or not. Um, I wanna challenge each of you to think of ways that you can make a difference, whether it's in your life or someone else's life, because one thing I've realized over the last couple of years is one person can really make a difference. And I'm truly honored that I've been given the opportunity to be in this space today with all of you. The conversation and discussion has been just amazing. My children are wondering why I let them watch so much Ada Twist Scientist tonight. So they're all giving you a big thank you as well. Um, but I'm going to pass it back over to Stephanie. Thank you again so much, Stephanie, for um, hosting this space and to all of you for joining us tonight. It's my honor. And I, if I may, for those of you that are in medicine, um, from the bottom of my heart and from the bottom of the hearts of people in this country who you haven't heard from yet, who may not be using social media, we deeply appreciate your sacrifice. We appreciate your efforts. We know that you're burned out. We know that you are tired. We know that you couldn't have imagined that you were going to be in the first quarter of 2022, not only fighting for people's lives, but fighting against disinformation and being worried about our country and our world. We thank you. For those of you who are here tonight, men in medicine, we thank you for your sacrifice, for your attention, for your time, for your energy. We know that you are burned out too. And for those of you who are not in medicine, who are not necessarily a patient right now, any person living in the world, you are also tired. And we want to end with saying thank you because we have very little time 
and you're, you've chosen to spend your time with us this evening, and we are honored by your presence, by this incredible conversation, by your listening, by your participation. So I want to wish everybody here well. Be kinder than you need to be. Be kinder than necessary, because everybody's having a hard time, and we do so much better together than we do apart. We have recorded this space tonight. Once it is recorded, you will be able to go back and access and listen. We look forward to doing more of these spaces. We wish all of you good health. Please be around people who love you and that you love back. Stay healthy, everybody, and thank you for joining us this evening. Take care. We hope to see you soon. Good night, everyone.